This is a public service announcement which might save your life. They aren't telling you something about dirty fighting. So, first of all, who are they? Well, it's those people that you see all over the internet and even in older, like, video programs, whatever the usual term for those is, where they say, you know, use these special techniques in street fights or whatever. When somebody's attacking you, this is what you do to save your life. And usually they recommend some sort of dirty fighting technique, like poking somebody in the eyes or kicking them in the crotch or something like that. And these techniques are presented as being like cheat codes for real life. You just use them and then you win just because. The idea is that if you can't fight otherwise, like you're not good at fighting or you're just weak or something like that, then this is supposedly what you need to do to win fights and you will win fights anyway. Most often I think this this comes up kind of packaged with a, a specific scenario or, or not not exactly specific but it's kind of implied that you're going to be like a 90 pound woman and this you know 180 pound man just walks up to you on the street and tries to rape you or something and this is when you use these techniques so the focus on this specific scenario is kind of a red flag showing that people are trying to scare you into I guess buying whatever it is that they're selling and they're not really familiar with other rape scenarios like they don't really understand too much about defending yourself against rape but even in this case, it's kind of a, a stretch, because being a 90-pound a woman doesn't mean that you can't defend yourself, or that you can't get stronger in order to defend yourself. Women can get strong. It's... I don't know if I should even call it a myth that they can't. It's more, more like a prejudice. Like, even people who, who claim to be feminists and whatnot often view women as these helpless, frail creatures, and uh, that's just not a realistic view. And I've heard other genetic excuses for certain people not being able to defend themselves, but that doesn't mean that you can't get strong. Most often, genetics are just used as an excuse when people either... I don't want to accuse people of just not wanting to uh, to get fit or learn to defend themselves. It's more like a, a mental obstacle, like they've been convinced that they can't, and they don't really understand where they're getting that idea, so they attribute you know, their, their failures when they make very small efforts to genetics, and really most people have no genetic barrier whatsoever to becoming strong enough to just handle themselves in general. But the one thing that that inspired me to make this video, which really kind of ticked me off, was this real-life superhero manual. It's supposed to teach you like how to fight crime and whatever. Not always literally fighting crime, but they encourage reporting crimes and whatnot, and just community outreach. But they have this whole section on fighting, and in that section, it included this whole article, which it describes itself as women's self-defense. And it's all this dirty fighting, you know, cheapo stuff that you, you really shouldn't be going into a fight planning to use. If you are planning to go out and basically start fights with criminals, I mean, you, you can talk about the details and whatnot, but the basic idea behind being a, well, behind fighting crime in a literal sense is that you are going out and picking fights with criminals who are going to want to, you know, fight back. You know it's going to be a fight, so if you're looking for the easy way out, stop. Like, that's just not a smart strategy going into any fight. 
because there isn't really an easy way out. These uh, dirty fighting techniques, like I said, people see them as, as sort of cheat codes. They're not. They're more like special moves. Like if you've played uh, some kind of fighting game, well, typically there will be a bunch of weird special moves that you can use by entering the right combo on your controller, and then you can uh, do something cool. But in order to use these moves, you typically need to set them up using the basic techniques of the game, like to just use a, a direct example from Mortal Kombat. Kano, in the original game, had this cannonball move where you, you kind of dial on the, the D-pad and then he goes flying forwards. And I remember it being really hard to pull that off unless you had the right setup. And you set up with basic jumps, the, the normal punches and kicks, and stuff like that, so really if you don't know the basics then you can't you can't use those moves effectively and in real life every fighting technique requires a base in just general techniques even the most basic punch requires full body fitness and involvement your arm goes out obviously and there's a technique to that it's actually not just a matter of, of just throwing your hand out there. You also need to, to put your shoulder into it, and your core, like all your abdominal muscles, are actually involved when you punch, and your legs. And not only are your legs adding power to the punch, but you need to place your legs properly. And you need to place your legs properly in a high-stress environment very quickly, and ultimately all of this stuff requires you to know what you are doing across the uh, spectrum of fighting skills. If you just, uh, you know, read one of these articles that says, you know, if you're in danger, then, you know, poke the person's eyes out. Well, what you're probably going to do if you ever decide to put that into practice is you're probably going to first tuck your arm in front of your body it's not really necessary for poking somebody's eyes out, but you're probably going to do it just because you think of the motion as, as going outward from your body and not from wherever your hand is. And you're going to make your little hand gesture for, for poking somebody's eyes out. Then you're going to tense up your arm, which is a really stupid idea, but you instinctively want to do it because, uh, well... I could probably get into like the whole reason for why people do that, but it's really not what you want to do. You need to build up the willingness to actually do that kind of damage to somebody, which is it's something you instinctively don't want to do. Then you need to have good enough aim to actually hit their eyes, which could go completely wrong. They never seem to mention this in the, the self-defense articles, but you could just miss somebody's eyes and, like, hit their cheek or something, which does nothing. I mean, basically nothing. It'll bruise them, but that's it. And then you need to apply enough force to do actual damage to their eyes. And you're not going to be able to complete that whole sequence in a real fight. You're more likely to just make your opponent angry. Unless, of course, they are already angry. I mean, I talked about that uh, rape scenario, which people just assume, and you might not be in that kind of situation. You could be in a situation where your opponent is angry at you, and maybe they intend to kill you, so you can't really make it any worse. But on the other hand, you really need to make it better, and you're in trouble if you don't. Really, we could question the, the effectiveness of these dirty fighting techniques in any situation, like, beyond just whether or not it acts like a cheat code. There's some question as to whether there's any benefit to learning them at all. If you look at classical Victorian boxing, or I think it's in the Victorian period, but there used to be a time when the Queensbury rules that we use today had not been created yet, and I think they used rules known as the as known as Broughton's rules, 
and these rules only had like two techniques that you weren't allowed to use. I think it was like eyes and throat. Everything else was completely fair game. You could grab people, you could kick them, you could... It was basically like MMA today, except with even fewer rules. And if you look at the way they fought back then, they weren't using all of these like attacks to the, the crotch and the spine and whatnot. They weren't really using dirty boxing, they were they were using boxing. Like, not quite the way they do it today, because there are some considerations. They, they fought more like uh, MMA fighters today, again, except there wasn't really any ground fighting, because a round ended when someone hit the ground. But, like, again, they didn't use all these dirty fighting techniques, even though they had the option to use many of them. They, they, they basically used the basics. They didn't use a whole lot of fancy techniques, they mostly focused on being very good at the things that you always need to be able to do in a boxing match, or in an, uh, well, they called them boxing matches then, so, yeah, boxing match. Some people might think, um, especially the Shotokan people, they might be thinking, oh, but, but we train those techniques, They're, they were totally used... You know, completely 100% historical, because my sensei says so, that kind of thing. Uh, I, I don't really want to start a fight with the Shotokan people here, but a lot of that stuff appeared later. Like, there's this whole idea of, of historical stasis in martial arts, especially in schools like Shotokan Karate, People like to think that they're doing exactly what people back in history were doing, and yet some of it doesn't even work in normal fights. You gotta watch out for that stuff, because sometimes people aren't really testing their techniques, and they think they work, but they really kind of don't. Again, the, kind of the, the overall point that I'm trying to make here Aside from the, the main point about dirty fighting not being something that you can rely on on its own, is that you, you, really, you really shouldn't underestimate the fundamentals of fighting technique. I remember watching this one Street Fight video where uh, some, some Yahoo was kind of uh, goaded by his friends to challenge this professional fighter of some kind to a fight. For a while they were just they were just kind of maneuvering around each other, uh, looking for an opening, you know, that sort of thing. And then the professional threw what we call a feeler jab, which is basically a quick hand motion intended more to gauge distance and keep pressure on your opponent and stuff like that than to actually do damage, but it knocked the other guy down, and he was struggling to stand for a while after that. But he didn't give up because... because he was a moron. <laughs> and uh, then he got knocked out by, you know, a one-two punch. It was really, really basic stuff, but someone who can't handle the basics I just stated my conclusion. If you can't handle the basics, then you can't handle the basics. So, a little bit, or uh, maybe not a little bit, but a decent amount of proper self-defense training is going to go a lot farther than some article or video on YouTube telling you how to cheat at fighting. And a lot of, a lot of the people who you might end up fighting are probably going to have some basic level of fighting experience or training. And so really the, the self-defense advice that you get in a lot of places on the internet is not going to do you any good against them because they have something better. So here's what you should do for self-defense. Just so I'm not doing the whole stick without a carrot thing. Here, here's what you do do. First of all, do some kind of conditioning work. And by that I mean just some sort of load-bearing exercise, some kind of cardio. You don't have to go like all CrossFit games with it, but 
do something to keep yourself in shape so that you have a physical base to work from. The one best thing for you to do is probably sprinting. You know, sprinting does help with weight loss and it can build muscle in your legs if you do it right. But mostly, for the most part, getting away from a fight is going to put you in a better position than pretty much anything that you can do in the fight. You also want to do some kind of heavy lifting. And I don't mean that in the sense of literally lifting a heavy object. Find some way to challenge your muscles. A lot of people are kind of afraid of this. Like, even if they go to the gym, they'll hold themselves back and, and just lift an amount of weight that feels comfortable for them. But you get most of your results from pushing yourself and uh, getting close to your limit. People can get injured like this, but normally, normally, injuries that you see in the, those gym injury videos, if you've ever watched one of those, they happen because somebody was doing something wrong. If you stick to proven good form on all of your exercises, then you should be safe. Also, try to do something every day. Uh, some people, well, I guess most people will take rest days in between their more intense days of training, but a rest day doesn't need to mean that you aren't doing anything. You want to make sure that you're always prepared, so even on the days when you do some kind of intense exercise, just don't push yourself so far that you're really sore the next day and you can barely move, because at that point you're creating days when you won't be able to defend yourself effectively, so it defeats the point. And of course you do need to learn a martial art. You should go to an actual martial arts school and learn from somebody in person. It's sort of possible to learn from, you know, YouTube videos or books or whatever. There have been actually very successful people who did that, but you need to do some kind of sparring at some point to be able to apply those techniques effectively. And so you might as well go to a martial arts school right from the beginning and make sure that they do some kind of sparring there. Uh, and maybe look for uh, members of the school who are going into competition. Some martial arts that you might want to consider if, if you have options are Krav Maga, which does include a lot of the dirty fighting stuff because it was originally designed for street fighting. Basically, um, it was made for the Jews to defend themselves against the Nazis, and so they didn't really care about uh, being polite, <laughs> exactly. And uh, it's still used by the Israeli military today, so it's definitely a solid option. You might want to consider wrestling or jiu-jitsu, because a lot of unexpected fights begin when somebody grabs you and you're not expecting a fight. And so, it could be very helpful to learn how to break someone's grip or, you know, get out of a chokehold or something so that you can deal with fights that begin that way. It's also very helpful for, uh, I mean, wrestling in particular is helpful for controlling whether or not a fight goes to the ground, which is very useful because if you need to run away from a fight, it helps to get your opponent on the ground so that they can't chase after you for a good few seconds and you, you get a head start. Boxing is very popular. You might want to look into boxing. It's all about the, uh, the basics of striking and footwork and uh, guarding, of course, although the guarding in, in boxing is typically different from what you'd want to do in a street fight just because you have these big padded gloves on and they allow you to do certain kinds of blocks that might not work on the street. And of course, karate, it's associated mostly with punching and kicking, but it's more of a general style that it wasn't designed for much of a rule set, and so it, it can contain dirty fighting techniques depending on which school you go to. Uh, just watch out for a so-called McDojos, which are basically places that are all style and no substance. 
So those are some options that you can potentially use to defend yourself. Obviously, you can't defend yourself just from having listened to my voice talk about this stuff, but you should now be in a better position to learn to defend yourself, which is what you really need to do.